Hello everyone, it's good to be back. I know it's been a few months, I've been quite busy lately. Had all kinds of things going on, I've been busy trying to develop my projects, I'll talk a little bit about them later. But I also had back surgery, which is unexpected. I guess it just shows, goes to show we're all getting a little bit older. Um, I am recovering, so that's good. I just didn't expect to have that kind of surgery at this age, but here we are. Anyway, I want to talk today about energy transition. This is something that has had a lot of hype over the last few years. I hope the hype is peaked, but I'm not naive enough to think that it has peaked completely and it might come back again. But it is time that we really understand the implications of all this hype. See, energy transition is something that mankind has been doing since, you know, the dawn of civilization, I guess. Uh, over 150 years ago, we went from solid fuels to coal, and then we went from coal to oil, and oil to gas, and now we maybe transition to something else. But the key message is that, that the transitions take decades and decades. And just because we have transitioned from one fuel to the other, that doesn't mean that the other fuel is still not being used. In fact, we may have transitioned from coal, you know, 50 years ago when we started using oil for transportation, but we still burn a lot of coal. And in fact, last year we had a record amount of coal being used. So the message is energy transitions take a long, long time. And especially when we're going into new forms of energy, new forms of energy that don't have the same characteristics of the old forms of energy. In the past, we transitioned from one form of energy to the other, but all the energy could be stored. We could store coal, we could store gas, we could store oil, and we could store solid fuels. Now we're talking about transitioning to energy that cannot easily be stored. And that's really the key, because without storage, that means we cannot transport it very easily either. Without storage and transportation, we really make it very hard for that energy, that new energy, to completely replace the energy that we think we're going to replace. Energy has to be available, affordable, and acceptable. Out of these three things, availability is the key. More than half of the planet lives in places where they do not have available energy and they're still burning very, very basic forms of energy. It is very naive of us to think that our sitting here in the rich world, that we can now force upon half of the world to transition from almost no energy to something that is hardly even affordable for us in the rich world. I used to think institutions like the World Bank and the IEA you know, were very non-political and factual and said where the way things are, you know, give us really good solid data to work on. In fact, 30 years ago, I had a job offer from the World Bank and I didn't take it and I regretted it for many years. I thought the World Bank would have been a great career. And one of the World Bank's objectives, in my view, is to alleviate poverty around the world. Why the World Bank to the world a massive injustice a few years ago by publishing a report saying that we should stop investment in oil and gas? They, said, they may not have said those exact words, but that's what kind of what they implied. And now we're seeing many institutions that now use that as a reason not to support investments in oil and gas. The IEA has been incredibly hypocritical. From the age of natural gas, that they, the, you know, the golden age of natural gas, they said five years ago, they've suddenly gone to natural gas as the enemy. And they're now hyping all kinds of transition fuels that are just not realistically going to happen in the time frame they do. The world still gets 99% of all its hydrogen from very basic forms of energy, such as coal and natural gas. To make hydrogen clean, you have to get it from clean energy, such as renewable power. Well, renewable power is hardly available in many parts of the world. And to think that now we're going to transition and change our gas grids around the world and force people to start using hydrogen, when that 99% of the hydrogen literally comes from natural gas and coal, and it's suddenly going to come from electrolyzers and, and green energy, is very, very naive. When we have a long way to go, the world doesn't produce enough electrolyzers. If we have that much clean energy where we need it, we should burn the clean energy. We shouldn't classify hydrogen produced from nuclear as being a good thing. If we have nuclear, that means you have no intermittency, you have clean, cheap power, you have continuous power, use that, as opposed to using that like nuclear and then use, uh, wasting 30, 40, 50 percent of it to make hydrogen and then somehow figuring out how to transport hydrogen, which has to transport in liquefied form at a minus 253 degrees. This is just crazy stuff. But I've seen it taking over very seemingly, you know, 
big organizations that should know better. I was talking to an organization the other day that whose sole business is LNG, who now says that they have to have some other low carbon story with any of the investments. They have no experience in any other investments, but now they need to weave a low carbon story along with the, any LNG investments that they do. It's not a zero sum game. We should let energy investments continue wherever energy investments need to go. We shouldn't force the large energy companies that are very good at producing oil and gas to then stop producing oil and gas. Let them produce oil and gas and you're welcome to invest in companies that produce other forms of energy and healthy competition is good for everybody. But it's wrong for us as shareholders of large corporations say, to demand that they stop producing this fuel and that's all they can do and that's all they are good at and the world still needs that fuel because if they stop producing it, the production reduces and it falls in the hands of less and less people and that's not good for mankind because mankind needs a lot more energy. Yes, we don't like to use coal because it's dirty, absolutely. But if the choice is dirty coal or no electricity at all and freezing in the dark, what are your options? I was in India a few months ago and I was surprised how polluted the air was because they were burning coal because gas was expensive. Now gas has got cheaper again and they're going to go back to burning gas. But at the end of the day, we cannot deprive the world of energy that it needs. And what's distressing is the fact that this has permeated throughout all kinds of organizations. I'm trying to raise money for an LNG project. Now LNG to me is still the ultimate transition fuel. It can be easily be transported. We have infrastructure in 50 countries. Everywhere that has a coastline is looking at either importing LNG or exporting LNG at some form or the other, especially in most of the world that can afford it. But now we're making it very, very difficult to get financing. By making it difficult to get financing and stopping banks from investing in, in LNG projects, all we are doing is forcing a large part of the world not to have energy at all. Because then LNG only goes to the richest customers and the poor customers will then have to go back to burning coal or cow dung or whatever they have to burn. So these, everything has implications. Yes, energy transition is something we should be working at. Yes, energy transition is good. Yes, we should reduce our carbon intensity of the world's economies, but no, we shouldn't stop investing in transition fuels such as LNG and gas. We need these, these fuels to then help support the grid. For every megawatt of renewable power that you do, you need to have backup power because the sun doesn't shine, the wind doesn't blow, etc., etc. We are making it incredibly hard to build that backup power. We all know it's very hard to build transmission lines. It's hard to build gas pipelines. It's hard to find labor to do any of these things. But yet naively, we're shutting down what we already have and asking our companies to shut down what we have. And we're not supporting the expansion of what we have to even continue with the basic energy requirements the world needs. So I guess the message here is we need to, yes, go right ahead and invest in projects, all types of energy projects. Ideally, don't take it all. A project should not be based solely, the economics of a project should not be based solely on government subsidies. A lot of these projects, hydrogen, ammonia, etc., etc., even offshore wind, are based on having government subsidies indefinitely. That cannot be good for the world economy. Yes, you might need subsidies to get things kicked off, but you need to stop them very quickly. We need to invest in all types of energy and yet overall we should be reducing the energy intensity of our economies. We should be careful about not jumping into things that we not don't fully understand. I would venture to say that most people who are talking about carbon storage have no idea what they're talking about. I'm a geophysicist by profession. I have studied carbon storage. I have studied the world's rocks for many, many years. It's not that simple to just take carbon and put it in the ground. It's very difficult to, it's, it's easier to do that if it's pre-combustion, such as in a gas plant, but much harder to do that post-combustion, such as in a power station. It's very difficult to do that for coal, to remove carbon from coal, 
especially because that's what burns in the power station. And it's not going to be a panacea. So don't expect, oh, we're not going to have green hydrogen, so we're going to make it blue hydrogen, and the blue hydrogen is going to come from producing hydrogen from coal and shoving the carbon this miraculously in the ground. The same people that were complaining about fracking, which, by the way, is completely out of hand, was out of hand. That was a big thing that everybody jumped on. And in the end of the day, America, I would venture 60, 70, 80% so of its gas production now comes from frack gas. And the environmental impact is minimal. But we still have bans on frack gas in most parts of the world. We have bans on all kinds of gas exploration. In Victoria, where I live in Australia, you can't even drill a well. Yet our electricity prices are going up 20, 30%. And we can't build power lines to build the renewable in. And the government thinks that it's going to build seven farm, offshore farms of 100 windmills each in the most roughest seas of the world on the Bass Strait here. And it's all going to miraculously happen very easily. So, yes, we should look at energy transition. We should continue investing in, in the new technologies. But don't make them completely dependent on government handouts. And let the companies that want to invest in them, invest in them. But don't stop other companies, legacy energy companies, to invest in what they do best, which is producing energy that's affordable, available, and acceptable. So, at the end of the day, I guess I'm saying all this with a bit of frustration. I'm trying to raise money for my new LNG project. I think it's a great project. I think it has a lot of legs. I think the world needs more LNG. We don't have enough coming from the US. We don't have enough coming from other places for the demand that we need. We don't have a lot of new projects. There's no new project in the FERC system since 2019. I hope to be that new project. But we need investors. And I've talked to so many people who just say we can't invest in oil and gas anymore. And I think that's very naive. It's good to see a little bit of movement recently on some US contracts. Maybe some FIDs will finally happen, but not enough. We need a lot more FIDs to happen. I know FIDs aren't happening because costs have gone up and the prices are low. But the customers are willing to pay for the price of energy. They're willing to pay for green hydrogen. For God's sake, they're willing to pay for low carbon LNG. So we need investors to continue investing in all forms of energy. And the less restrictions we have, the better. We should have permitting uh, clarity and transparency around the world so we know what we're doing. And we shouldn't have government politicians decide which forms of energy are best. Let the market decide. And if there is a carbon penalty for a dirty form, then so be it. But we need to have more energy overall and not limit energy. Otherwise, we are all going to be literally freezing in the dark. Hope that was fun. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time.